I'd like to introduce our next speaker. It is Philip Tenari, who is the head curator of this inaugural Biennale, Feeling the Stones. Many audiences may be wondering what the role of a curator is in today's society in the contemporary art realm. Philip is going to give us some of his insights and we look forward to welcoming him here on stage. Thank you. Um, hello, good evening everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, it's really, uh, this is actually my last sort of obligation before I'm, I'm gonna sadly have to leave Riyadh tomorrow. So this is sort of a, a farewell in, in a ways and I think it's a, a good place to start. Um, so I hope that I can tell you a bit about like what I think of as a curator. I think this is actually really interesting. Um, we've been obviously in conversation with the team uh, from public program for DBF for the Duria Biennale for a long time now. And I was excited when they uh, mentioned this idea of doing these DB 101 programs, um, which um, you know give us a chance to talk about topics that might seem basic or ideas uh, kind of from the ecology of the art world as opposed to, you know, so thematic and so theoretical or so directly connected to a particular exhibition. Um, so I think it's great that Renim and her team thought to add this, and I think it actually fits very well with the concept of the Biennale, um, this idea of feeling the stones, of being very self-conscious about the fact that we're actually engaged in a larger project of building up an ecology and an infrastructure even as we go about realizing uh, this one particular iteration of this new exhibition. Um, so the fact that there is, I mean, this is the first, but there's there's a talk later about what is an exhibition designer. I'm sure some of you have seen the program um, about all different aspects of the art world and of, of the art system. Um, so hopefully uh, that will be interesting for people and, and there's an opportunity for really kind of open and equal knowledge transfer and exchange because I think that's kind of one of the weirdest things about the art world. Um, when I was first getting involved, and I'll sort of be talking about that tonight, it was the early 2000s and it was a time when there just wasn't that much online about contemporary art in general um, and about contemporary art in China, which was my original particular interest in, in particular. So um, it really was a difficult process of kind of trying to un come to understand, you know, even just how basic things worked um, or how, you know, what artists have made, how you even pronounce their names, to be honest, some of the time like was not information that was super widely available. And obviously that's that's changed a lot with the proliferation of uh, digital information that we've seen these last 20 years. Um, but it still doesn't change the fact that the art world has this way of seeming like it's this very mysterious and insidery kind of thing and that, um, you know, there's there's this system that operates in mysterious ways and people don't know where the door is. So it doesn't mean to be like that, and if you are already in it, or if you're considering a career in it, um, it won't always be like that, but that I, I still very close, you know, sort of with some terror remember, uh, you know, my first time at Art Basel Miami Beach, or first time going to an art forum dinner, or, you know, all these kinds of moments um, along the way when you're sort of finding your feet, and, and so, yeah, if we can get rid of some of that, I think that's a, a good service to perform, and so in that spirit, I'd love to leave time at the end for us to have a, more of an open conversation. Um, so I'm, I have some thoughts that I've just gathered. It's obviously it's been a little bit busy the last uh, couple of days, so it's not like you know some lecture being delivered at Harvard. Um, and I have a stream of images, which is basically a chronological um, look at some of exhibitions that I've worked on over the last actually. Amazingly, over the last 20 years, this one is from 2001, um, and that was actually the the project that I did as a senior at Duke University, which is where I did my undergraduate work, which is in North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina. They have a very good basketball team, um, and and they had a great museum. And the museum, amazingly, had what well, took. It's they have a much nicer museum now. It's a new museum. Well, it's not even new. It was built in 2005, um, but the museum at the time, the Duke University Museum of Art was located in the same building where the program in literature was located. And that was actually my, my major. And that's the first thing that a lot of people ask is, did you study art history or did you study studio art? And the answer is no. Um, and I think a lot of curators that you'll meet didn't study art history and didn't train as artists, although there are also ones who did either or both of those things. Um, I was in a program in literature, which was really a program in kind of 
cultural theory. I think they changed the name of the undergraduate major now to global cultural studies, uh, which is much more a, a good description of kind of what it actually is or was. Um, but it was a lot of, you know, we, we read a lot of post-colonial theory, a lot of kind of post-structuralist theory, you know, the, the, the sorts of things that make up a lot of the theoretical uh, canon that we use to discuss contemporary art, even 20 years later. I mean, we're talking about things then uh, like identity politics, um, different ideas about gender, feminism, uh, race, you know, these kinds of topics, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and, and I guess I just found that uh, using this theoretical toolkit to think about contemporary art um, and then add China to the mix, because that's when I started to study Chinese and to study China, um, was a really interesting thing to do. And so, kind of amazingly, because, I mean, some of you have gone to American universities and you know how, how much money they have. <laughs> um, they, they had this program at Duke where every year they would choose two seniors and, and give them the, the main gallery in the museum and let them curate an exhibition. And we had a, and that was kind of counted as your thesis project. So I worked with another student, a woman called Randy Reiner, and she was, uh, I mean, nobody's really a, a, an expert at that point in their career, but she was uh, interested in Japanese contemporary art. And so we put together this exhibition, which was called Made in Asia, with a question mark at the end. Um, and it was nine artists, Chinese, Japanese, and South Korean, who were working outside of their home countries. and. We're very concerned with questions about identity, transnationalism, um, diaspora, globalization. Uh, kind of amazingly, if you look in the back of that image, you'll see these flags on the wall, and they're actually all um, made of sand. So it's like an ant farm, and the ants would pick up grains of sand and go from one to the other and mix the na flags of the nations around. So that piece is actually by Yukinori Yanagi. Um, who's the artist who made the, the installation of the shipping containers that's in the main courtyard of the Biennale. Um, and I'd actually never met him in person. So 20 years later, it's kind of great to finally meet an artist who was in your very first show. But elsewhere in that show, you have artists like um, That Doll is by Takashi Murakami. I mean, an artist who should be very familiar to all of you. Um, I should have asked my parents to give me like $50,000 and and buy that piece at that point because I would have been more, that would have been more productive than anything I've done in the rest of my uh, 20 years of working if I'd just taken that and set it in a warehouse somewhere. But that's another topic and we'll talk about it later and that's not what curators do. Um, you have uh, Kim Soo Ja at the very front, this welcome mat which is composed of many tiny uh, human figures is by a, a Korean artist called Do Ho So who we really wanted to actually include in this Biennale. He often makes these giant houses out of fabric, um, but for a lot of reasons it just didn't work out. And then it doesn't reproduce as well, but in the back you have the work of Huang Yongping, um, who was one of the key Chinese artists of, of the 80s and 90s. He just passed away, actually he passed away the day I first arrived in Jeddah working on this show in 2019. And um, um, what I wanted to say about him, oh, he was one of the three uh, Chinese artists who were included in this exhibition in 1989 called Magicians of the Earth, which is the exhibition that also included the, the piece by Richard Long, which is right at the entrance of our biennial and is very much an homage to, uh, to that earlier moment. So this was, this was very much my beginning point. I mean, what was interesting is that this is the kind of Asian contemporary art that was available um, in New York at that time. We basically borrowed all these works from galleries in, in New York, um, in Soho, and starting to move, they were all starting to move to Chelsea at that time. Um, and it was amazing to me, because I just, I didn't realize, like as a college student, you've never done this before, you know, that you can actually borrow artworks if you're working at a museum. Um, you know, we don't, yeah, and, 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 and put something together. So anyway, that's, a, that's a, just a starting point. So I guess what I, what I wanted to say is that, um, you know, talks about what does a curator often begin from, from the Latin roots of the word and the English uh, etymology of the word, of course, you know, the Latin curare means to take care of, to nurture. Um, and this word curator, I mean, in, in English, to a native English speaker, probably the first time you heard it, at least, you know, 30 years ago, was not in relation to art, it was in relation to the zoo. Uh, so that you know, the curator is the person who looks after the elephants or the the hyenas or whatever, and, and makes sure they're they're well kept and well fed. Um, but these days, 
everything is curated, right? So we, not just, I mean, exhibitions, sure, and it becomes this very pure form of curation, which curation, by the way, is not even really a word. Uh, when we type it into Microsoft, it still comes up with a red line under it, you know, after all these years, um, which is sort of awkward. Um, but, you know, so not just exhibitions are curated, playlists are curated, um, selections at stores are curated, um, even menus of snacks are curated, wine lists are curated, right? And, and everything is curated. And this is a conversation, curators, like those of us who curate exhibitions, we will sometimes find this really funny. Like there's actually a, a cafe in London Heathrow uh, in Terminal 5, I think it's uh, Terminal 3 or Terminal 5, um, called, called The Curator, and it's people endlessly take photos of it and post it on Twitter and think it's really funny. Um, so why is it such a popular term? And I think the simple answer is that because, like simply speaking, we've reached a point in the development of human society and the, in the evolution of, of capitalism, you know, where we have enough, right? There's, I mean, obviously it's not evenly distributed, but it, we're in a time of kind of um, material abundance and informational abundance. Um, and so, you know, producing value is not just about making new things, but about, it can even be about putting existing things together intelligently. Uh, and with a viewpoint, and that's kind of why this this word is with us in such an annoying and um, overused kind of way at this point. But it's inescapable. Um, so yeah, I just I guess I wanted to say that um, even after all of that, at the base of this act of curating is still that act of of care, uh, and a kind of care a care that extends in many directions, outward, inward, onward, um, and that is based on a, a special form of, of knowledge um, that is cultivated over a long period of time. Um, let's see what I have next. I'm gonna intersperse a little bit. Yeah, well, this is actually, this is like the second exhibition I curated. Um, this was 2000, and this is just one image. Um, this was 2003, and this was in the summer of 2003 in the, an area of Beijing. I'd moved to Beijing after college. I, I, I got a Fulbright scholarship and I went and studied um, Chinese. And because I'd done the exhibition I just showed you, I knew a few artists who knew a few artists. And so the art world at that time in China was underground and very small. I mean, probably fairly similar to the art scene in Saudi, you know, five or 10 years ago. Um, and so within a few days, you know, called someone who knew someone and. I would go to Chinese classes every morning from eight to 12, and then on the, on the weekends, I would go with, with this curator friend, a guy called Feng Bui, who would take me to exhibitions, and they would sometimes be you know, in villages outside the city in a sort of peasant house, or maybe they'd be in a bookstore, but hidden among the books, um, or in a new complex of apartment buildings that had just been erected. Um, they wouldn't be in museums, and they wouldn't be in galleries, because those things didn't really exist at that time. And so then suddenly, you know, the next year, so that was 2001, 2002, of course, 9-11, you know, the world is changing, you're far from home. And well, by the time we get to 2002, this amazing thing happened, which was this factory on the outskirts of Beijing, uh, very similar to Jack's, uh, it's called 798. Artists were starting to move in and galleries were just starting to move in and um, like an art publisher who had ran a website was starting to move in and suddenly there was this area in the city that was kind of for contemporary art and um, it was all quite exciting. It was these factories that had been built in the 50s, much actually, I hate I, to be honest, more beautiful than the Jack's warehouses. They were, they were designed by East German architects with these soaring concrete tresses and these sawtooth style roofs and um, Anyway, as it happens in every city, artists found them and were, were beginning to put studios there, all in a very grassroots way. Um, so I'm telling you all this because, first of all, this represented really the, the legitimization of the art, or the beginnings of the legitimization of sort of the art scene in China. And by that I mean, you know, contemporary art could suddenly exist in an open way um, and have a, start to have a public around it. And you know, I, I got involved immediately. This gentleman I was mentioning, Fumboy, he curated the first show that uh, happened in 798, and he brought me along as kind of an assistant, and I translated the catalog, and, you know, just apprenticed, essentially, and watched how he related to artists and how all these conversations would unfold. A, a year later, so I was preparing to go back to the U.S. and start my graduate studies, um, 
And seven, nine, eight in that year and a half, a lot of things had happened in the Chinese art scene. There'd been a big bi a triennial in Guangzhou. There had been um, a, a number of important exhibitions, and so and and then there had been a number of new galleries established in this area of seven, nine, eight. And this artist, this, one of them was called Long March, um, which is a, named after a famous moment in Chinese history in the 1930s when the, the Red Army, the Communist Army, was escaping the Nationalist Army and they traveled through China uh, fleeing you know, war and in the process kind of bringing their thought into line with the Chinese reality. So this gallery called Long March um, began actually as a recreation, as a curatorial project, recreating the route of the Red Army in the 2000s, in the 1930s. I worked actually with them, traveled with them, translated and edited and wrote a lot about what they were doing. And they set up a space in 798. And so this image is an artist called Wang Wei, um, who was actually a photographer at the Beijing Youth Daily, which is an important newspaper, um, who'd, who'd come to learn about these peasants, who you see in the picture, who basically um, were collecting bricks from houses that were being torn down close to the city and then carting them away on carts that were then still drawn by horses and mules to f our areas farther out in the city where they would then resell them and the bricks would be reused. Uh, so he had a project or a proposal. So he got to know them through his photojournalism. And he had a dream, which was, or not a dream, but a project proposal, which was to basically hire a bunch of them to bring bricks into 798 um, to build a useless structure in the gallery that just left one meter on each side, filled the whole space, um, have the so-called opening on the day when the structure was built, uh, and then have, the, have, the, have these guys then tear the building down again and sell the bricks onward. It's funny, like to talk about it now, it almost sounds a little bit ridiculous um, and even exploitative. Um, but certainly like, strange but it this was a proposal very much in keeping with you know it, it, at the moment this seemed like a really intelligent commentary on the situation and he's a photographer at heart so he well, the main work that this exhibition produced was a series of photos each taken from exactly this uh, angle and this is before you know you put a time lapse camera in front of every work you were installing so every day he would take a photo and you'd see the brick structure going higher and higher um, and then it, this is right after it was torn down or w at the beginning of it being torn down. So, you know, in the beginning you would just see the guys and then the walls are rising and then finally get torn away and then finally it returns to nothing. So uh, anyway, so that was the second exhibition I ever curated and, and it was a much different experience, obviously, than curating a, an exhibition in a, um, you know, museum at an American university. So in, in China, the word for curator actually, and it's uh, only appeared in the mid 2000s, around exactly the time I'm talking about. Um, and before that it was, people never really knew how to translate it. And I've heard even from Wedge Dan, our co-curator uh, on this exhibition that I think the, the discourse in, around contemporary art in Arabic is in a similar place. There are a lot of terms at the moment which don't have super established translations. And that's a really interesting place to be that's full of possibility. Because now that term in Chinese is very much set and everyone knows it, it's called cijanran. And, it, and it literally means a planner, a person who plans or strategizes and, and makes exhibitions. And in a way that's an homage or it's very similar to a term that was coined in the 1970s. Um, by a gentleman called Harold Zeman, who we might think of as, in a way, the first curator, or the first curator in this contemporary sense. Um, he referred to himself as an Ausstellungsmacher, a maker of exhibitions. Um, and this was a new thing you know, in Germany in the 70s, or Switzerland, actually, um, because before that, exhibitions had tended to be made by people who worked in museums, and he wasn't that. He was an independent operator. And you know he's so famous that there are even now there's a major exhibition that's traveled around the world about his curatorial practice, and you see his notes, and you see uh, his journals from his trips to you know if he would go from Switzerland to New York, and he has a page in his little notebook, and it's got you know John Baldessari and Lawrence Wiener and uh, Donald Judd, you know all the great artists of of that moment. So he was very much uh, the example of the curator as the kind of center of a generation and organizing exhibitions that really pushed the artists and their practices forwards. Um, I just say that to note that there's lots of different kinds of curators, right? There's independent curators, there are institutional curators. Uh, 
within institutional curators, you have the kinds of curators you see at, at, at a Kunsthalle, you know, an, inst, uh, an, ex, an exhibitions driven institution without a huge collection versus the kind you find at an encyclopedic museum like, or even a focused modern and contemporary art museum, a place like MoMA or the Metropolitan or the National Museum here in Riyadh, for example. Um, you find some curators who have very deep specialties in one particular area. You have others who have broad interests. You have curators who are, who are also poets. You have curators who are also artists. You have curators who are also musicians. Uh, it goes on and on and on. Um, and then another, another figure that we should mention in a way very much like the contemporary heir uh, to Zeman is a guy you may have heard of called Hans Ulrich Obrist, also Swiss, uh, born 1968 who in the 90s basically um, came up with a, a, a way of being a curator in this globalized art world that's still very compelling to a lot of people. And I would say, you know, where Zeman was really like the center of a, of a generation, uh, Hans Ulrich has become much more like a platform, you know, a constant um, node of connecting different, different artists, different people in the art system with each other. So these are all different modalities of of what that means. Um, so when we talk about you know, what it means to be a curator, it often comes down to talking about different kinds of metaphors or different kinds of comparisons. Um. Okay, so this is actually fast forwarding quite a while. Um, this is 2012. Um, I guess I really didn't make any shows for seven or eight years. Um, I did, but they're not really worth showing you. Um, this is this because because actually in that time I did a lot of other things. But um, this is after I joined UCCA, which is the you know the institution I run to net today. Um, it's called it was originally called Ulen Center for Contemporary Art. Uh, the Ulen's family they were Belgian or they are Belgian collectors of contemporary art and specifically at that time of contemporary Chinese art. Um, and this tells you a lot about kind of the situation in China at that time. Actually, the two biggest collectors of contemporary Chinese art were Guy Ulens and then another guy called Uli Sig. So Guy, a Belgian industrialist, um, Uli was, was the actually the Swiss ambassador in Beijing in the late 90s. And at this time when um, contemporary, China, contemporary art in China was at that earlier stage I just mentioned, you know, these two people exerted a huge influence over the over the market and over the scene in general, and so Mr. Ullens in 2007 um, decided to set up an institution in China devoted to contemporary art and to cultural exchange, and that's that's what we are now. So it's now been 15 years. Um, long story short, in 2016, 2017, he actually sold UCCA. Uh, so everyone always called it UCCA. After the sale, we now we don't call it Olin's anymore. We just call it UCCA. I always joke it's a little bit like KFC. You know, it used to stand for Kentucky Fried Chicken, and now it's just KFC. Um, so I joined in 2011, and um, this was the first exhibition that I made, first solo exhibition. It's a solo show of an artist called Gu De Xin, um, who's actually, to give you some context, one of the other Chinese artists included in Magicians of the Earth. There were three total. Um, he was also a very close collaborator of the artist Wang Luyan, whose sculptures you see in, in B2 um, in the first section. Right when you come out of Kentridge, there's this area where you have about 90 different sculptures on wooden pedestals. Um, so they, were, they worked together. They had a group called the New Analysts Group, highly conceptual art. Um, and, and one thing that Gudesin is very known for, or was very known for, because he's a super complicated figure, and actually um, in 2009, he completely withdrew from the art world, and he hasn't made a work of art since. He's alive, he's healthy, um, but he just stopped. But all through the 1990s, when Chinese art was kind of going global and being shown internationally, and into the 2000s as well, he would get these invitations to show his art at these, mainly at shows you know, by, made by curators, um, in, mainly in European cities, uh, mainly with the word you know, China in the title, and really trying through you know, a group of, let's say, 20 artists to tell a story about 
know, contemporary Chinese politics and often a very political story from a very Western perspective that was trying to argue, you know, that these were repressed artists speaking up for freedom or, you know, all the kinds of discourses we know so well. And, and a lot of artists were responding to this in really obvious ways. So making, you know, symbolic art, art, a genre of art that I've called Mao with a Coke can art, you know, so like paintings that mixed symbols of communism and symbols of capitalism in a really uh, easy way um, and drew on this recent experience of, of Chinese history during the Cultural Revolution or, or later. Um, and so Gu Dixin did something totally different, which was he only ever titled his pieces with the date on which they were created. So every work, I can't tell you any of the titles because I forget the, the, the dates, but you know, say that would be like 1999.3.24 or something. Um, and, and what he became very well known for, I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of work. You know, on the, in the far corner you have, like it's a choir loft almost, uh, on the risers of these little battery operated dolls who just move back and forth until their batteries uh, expire, which is pretty quickly. But what you really have is, um, on the left you see, and along the flagpole also, you see apples. And the apples are just left to decay. And they're left, uh, they're left there through the whole course of the exhibition. So the, the installation is constantly you know, degrading and degenerating as the, as the course of the, of the show goes on. I mean, is, it a, is that a social commentary? Is that just the way nature works? Um, is it anything? It's a, it's a big and deep question. Um, so for me, when I first started at UCCA, uh, which before had been very much um, connected to the market and, and kind of a bit flashy, this was, a, this was a, an interesting place to start. It was a way of asserting a new faith in the power of the Chinese avant-garde to, you know, to say smart things in a tough way, um, uh, to maybe, maybe in a way that not everyone understood immediately, but you know, that I thought could make a lasting impression. And it did make a lasting impression because if you come to UCCA today and you go to this corner of the space, you'll actually notice on the ground there are many small circles and the circles are left by the acid from the apples that came through as they uh, deteriorated and um, corroded the floor. <laughs> so that was the first thing I did after getting the job and they didn't fire me. Um, but I, that also does speak to, you know, the fact that there is a whole science to presenting art and it's something that we, we learn about um, and perfect as we go along through our careers. So what is a curator? Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of, of dichotomies or, or sort of comparisons of, of metaphorical you know, roles that people use. And the first one is director versus producer, right? It comes to us from film. Um, is the curator the auteur? Is, is the curator the person driving the narrative or is the curator the person behind the scenes making the narrative possible? I'll answer the question. It's a little bit of both. Sorry to spoil the surprise. Um, the auteur, or the puppeteer. Um, recently, the Guardian in England, the, I, I think it was Adrian Searle, one of the critics there, I, well, I got into a wonderful Twitter fight with various curators explaining why he never credits the curator in the, in the review of the exhibition. Um, because to him, the point of the exhibition is to see the art, right? To see the work of the artist. And the curator is someone who should be behind the scenes. Um, I agree sometimes. I mean, I, I think it's always something to balance. You know, in China, we often see exhibitions often at, sometimes at commercial galleries because a lot of times not even shows at commercial galleries will have, a, even solo shows at commercial galleries will have a curator. Um, we see the name of the curator and it's, sometimes it's on the poster. Sometimes the font is almost as big or I've even seen bigger than the name of the artist. Um, this, I don't know. I mean, everything is relative, but it, it, it tends to rub me the wrong way. And I tend to contrast it with, you know, go to a world-class museum. You'll see the name of the curator maybe at the very bottom of the wall text uh, in a smaller font, like actually you have at the entrance here, in a smaller font than the text itself, uh, alongside the credits for the sponsors and other institutional language. And that's exactly where it should be. I mean, I think... It needs to be there because you want to know, you know, whose fault it is if it's bad. Um, it's like the byline on a on a newspaper article, right? It's not there just so that that 
reporter can become more famous. It's there because at the end of the day, someone is responsible for these decisions and that's, that's the curator. Um, but yeah, I guess that's all just a, a way to talk about, um, you know, this role. And it's funny because, you know, I work in a museum now for our, an art institution for many years and curator is probably the most desired and envied title, right? The people in other departments, um, often come to me and they want to transfer into the exhibitions department and they'd like to become to become curators um so in the in the institutional context they're the people who are some who are out front right they're the person speaking at the press conference the person leading the tour uh in a way the person setting the agenda certainly the person making calls around the exhibition but um lesson number one is that the curator always absolutely needs to take a backseat to the artist um and i i, I this i always tell this story um, but um you have to learn very quickly <laughs> that you know artists they can be our friends but they don't have to be our friends um i i remember in it was 2005 i was just finishing graduate school and i at that time i was very close with a chinese artist you've probably heard of called ai weiwei um, and he was making an exhibition together with this actually an artist who was a protege of the guy I just mentioned, Harold Zeman, uh, an artist called Serge Spitzer. He's uh, a lawyer, uh, no longer with us. Um, he uh, sat in f across from me at, uh, at like, a, we were having a breakfast. I was talking to him about um, uh, an essay they'd asked me to write. And he said with a completely straight face, like he w explained to me that he was the most important artist of the 20th century. Um, <laughs> Surge? Not Ai Weiwei. No, no, not Ai Weiwei. Ai Weiwei has also done that. But um, no, this was this was, this was Surge, and um, I, you know, I I grew up in a in a very like in a in a Catholic background where there's a real premium on a certain kind of humility and um, you know not not shaking things up too much. And anyway, I I was kind of I was totally floored. I like couldn't believe he was saying this, and. Uh, but it occurred to me very quickly, like, wait a second, this is no longer, you know, I'm not looking at this person as a potential friend or, or even mentor, I'm looking at him as a person who I'm entering into a collaborative relationship with, and, like, he might have, you know, his own self-conception or his own motivations. Uh, the, re the only question is whether they will or will not, you know, get in the way of, of the work that's there to do together, and, and, and ultimately, whether the quality of that work justifies entering into that relationship in the first place. So that's, um, that's, that's all to say. Um, the other, the other thing on this idea of director versus producer, you know, cause of course the director is uh, the most famous director is still not as famous as the, as the, as the actors, right. Or the, the top actors at least. Um, the other question is, you know, how much does the curator need to know about the details and the specifics of how the exhibition comes together? And again, this is a total continuum. Um, a few years ago, I worked on a show at the Guggenheim that I'll talk about later. But you know, the, the interesting thing about a show at the Guggenheim is that the curators actually don't know the budget. So the curators make up a checklist, and then the exhibitions management department goes through and figures out how much that's going to cost and if it can be done. Um, and, and that allows the curators to keep their thinking and their work on this very academic level where I won't name names. No, it's not just the Guggenheim, but at this kind of a museum, you know, the curator might get all the way through a proposal and not even be thinking about like, can this piece of art actually fit in this space, or can we borrow it, or is it going to cost you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to ship to this location? Uh, the other school of thought is um, more like a place like like we work or like a place like PS1 works where from the beginning the curator is thinking about all of those logistical considerations that go into making a show and kind of incorporating them into their into their thought and planning process so i think they're they're kind of those are i mean they're two abstract extremes right on the one hand just doing it um, on this on this completely intellectual level uh, idealized level, and on the other hand, getting way down into the weeds and, and, and thinking from the beginning about all the details of production, of shipping, of insurance, of climate control, of security, of visitor relations. You know, there's a whole list. Um, 
and I, and I think it's just a question of of finding a a balance between those. You know, you never want to get so deep into the other stuff that you lose the thing that ostensibly makes you uh, valuable, which is that you are the one who needs to be thinking about what this all means artistically and and how it goes together. But at the same time. Um, you know, I get very uncomfortable with like when I was working at, I've been a guest curator at other museums when it's, you have this weird situation where the curators kind of come in and wave their hands and say how things, you know, how high things should go and then walk away while the actual labor, you know, happens and is done by, by other people. Um, okay. So that's the director producer thing. Maybe I'll talk about another exhibition. Um, so this is, this is an exhibition I made, a solo exhibition of William Kentridge. Um, whose work I think features really beautifully in, in, in the current, in this show um, across the way. If you haven't seen it, please do. Um, it's kind of interesting. This is 2015, which is actually the same year that uh, more, more, I can never remember the name, more sweetly play the dance, the piece that's, you know, that's here was made, but we didn't have that piece in our show. Um, I, I think of this as really the show where I found my feet as a curator in my space and my institution. And, you know, if you work in an institution, um, you'll spend three years kind of figuring out how the space works and what can be done there. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll make some mistakes along the way. Um, that's another. So we actually, you know, this, this show is so, so special. Um, Kentridge, you know, obviously most of the work is video. And what that means is that you need a lot of dark rooms, right? As you have actually in this exhibition. And the thing about dark rooms is that they're really boring from the outside, right? Uh, how many times do you wanna look at a black curtain, right? And then know that there's something on the other side. So how do you make that like interesting for a viewer? Especially when you know the whole exhibition is basically that. Of course, there are some paintings, there are these forms on the walls high, hung high, which are very actually the same as the forms that you'll see in, in More Sweetly Play the Dance. The piece here, um, but what? And this is not. This is. Well, I'll talk about this a little, a little bit more later too. But um, it's actually an exhibition design question. We worked for this exhibition with a, a actually a an actual sonographer. We call exhibition design sonographer, but this woman is actually a sonographer who who builds scenes and stage sets for operas and dramatic productions. A woman called Sabina Toynissen, uh, Belgian, and she told us to use, she came up with this design where all of the projection, and you can't get a great single image of this show. Most of the shows I curate, you can't get one image that sums them all up. But what you see on the right is the outside of some projection rooms. And what you see at the top is actually what you have in this next image, which is a second level. So we went over the top of all of these projection rooms and put on a second floor. So you could come up from behind and be on this plateau. And then you had this kind of little city beneath them that unfolded. And there were all these lines between and among uh, and in and out and punctuated by, by images. Um, this, you had here small videos on little screens that you could explore in almost like a studio setting. And then uh, you know, on the top you had one key piece that he'd made specially for this exhibition, but mostly it was a retrospective. Um, so yeah, so that's that was uh, it was called Notes Towards a Model Opera. The model operas were the eight um, kind of dance and song productions that were um, most uh, vaunted under, under uh, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, particularly by Mao's last wife, Jiang Qing. Um, so he was interested. I mean, Kentridge is in, interested in opera in general. He's designed stage sets for Shostakovich's The Nose, for Berg's. Um, Lulu and, and on and on and on. Um, so anyway, I, I chose him for that show and actually for this show as well because this is an artist who has come through one of the most significant social transformations we've seen, you know, in 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 living memory, which is you know South Africa's transition away from apartheid, um, and has thought very deeply about what that means, um, about the arbitrariness of the position that he occupied as actually. Um, the grandson of Jewish refugees to South Africa who left who left Lithuania in the late 19th century and went you know went to South Africa instead of going to Germany or somewhere else where they might have met a different fate, um, you know, and also someone who's uh, comes from a family that was instrumental uh, legally in the over in the end of apartheid. His father is a very important attorney in this context as well. So, uh, and then actually quite interestingly. 
most of his art uh, revolves around the drawing of the human figure. And that's because South Africa was during his whole, he was born in 1955, so as he was growing up, um, it was the, the period when the world was applying pressure to South Africa to, to abandon apartheid, and that meant a cultural boycott. Um, and that meant that, you know, as, a, as an art student, well, he was first a theater student, but then as an art student, he didn't encounter the latest ideas from, from Paris and from New York. He didn't, so he never got caught up in abstraction. He never really even got into color. So his art is very black and white. Um, and instead he got into figure drawing, which was a really conservative form um, at that time. Um, so strangely, you know, you had this global dynamic that created this specific local condition out of which his art grew. And then it grew from there to think again about all of these major global questions. And I think uh, on that level, and then even on the material level of he's often working in ink with a brush, um, which is, you know, the root of, of, say, Chinese painting as well. There was a lot of um, connection to this local context. And then, by the way, also, he showed in the Shanghai Biennale in 2000, was seen by a lot of Chinese artists, was even copied by a lot of Chinese artists. So it just seemed really interesting to just go straight to the source and do a major show of his work. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was quite successful. So that was, like, for me, really a, a time when I found my feet as a, um, as a curator. Um, so the second uh, sort of pairing I wanted to talk about is, are we really on? Okay. Um, is, is this difference of uh, being a writer versus being an editor. So I, 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 think I see curating as just another form of writing, you know, writing in space with artworks. Um, not to instrumentalize the artworks because, of course, they're completely autonomous. But when you're down to the making of an exhibition, you know, what, you're, what you need to be thinking about as a curator is how you use them to narrate something. It can be an argument for why this person's important. It can be an overview, giving a comprehensive look at what they've done and in which order. Um, it can be an essay, right? A, a, a show that puts different works together that have likely or unlikely connections. But it's, 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 a, it's a narrative job above all. And and on, a, on an even more practical level, a curator who can't write is a bad curator. I mean, they might be good at hanging paintings, but like, one needs to be able to get one's ideas across um, concisely, with nuance, um, compellingly, um, you know, word by word, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph. They're, they're not, you know, we're not novelists. We're not even, we're not journalists. Uh, we're not even really essayists, but. We do a particular kind of writing, um, and one that can have a tendency to slip into lots of unexamined jargon, you know, words that get thrown around without really being um, thought through. Uh, we, we, we're, we can be repetitive, we can copy, uh, we can, you know, use theory in ways that, it, that aren't super interesting or super deep. Um, but on the flip side, we have this great advantage, which is, you know, we're not just writing for the sake of it, we're writing to put together an experience um, in, in space. So an exhibition is a text. And just as a total side note, but because I'm sure there are people here who want to become curators, the best way to become a curator is to write a lot and to publish a lot in magazines, online, wherever. There's so many venues today, even on your Instagram posts, um, because that is the lowest overhead thing you'll ever do, right? You know, the only thing standing between you and writing is like wanting to go to sleep or um, you know having something else to do. Um, you know I think much more efficient than trying to get funds together to do a small show you know without any institutional support. Although that's important too, obviously. Um, but you know for people looking to build a reputation quickly, I think writing is just such a is the best possible way, honestly. And for me, you know I talked about eight years where I didn't really make that many exhibitions. That was because that's mainly what I was doing. Um, so writer, the other parallel, the other you know on the other side of this dichotomy, editor. And actually, what I did immediately before joining UCC is I, I started and I edited a magazine called Leap, uh, which was a bilingual Chinese English you know contemporary art magazine. And when I first took the job at UCCA, and then all the journalists were interviewing me and asking like why I had been chosen and what I was doing. This is exactly ten years ago. Um, I was quite confident because I said, you know, running an institution or putting together an exhibition is very similar to editing a magazine. Um, you're thinking about 
you know, when you flip through a magazine, what do you see? You see content that's well arranged, that has structure. You see clear themes, but also unexpected resonances. You see subtle connections among things. Um, magazines ha often have a front, a middle, and a back, right? You have small items, you have longer features, you have reviews or listings. Um, you can flip through from the back or the front, but the structure is apparent, sort of regardless. Um, and maybe more important than anything, and I'll come to this in a minute as well, they're dated. You know, very quickly they become dated, and they become a product of a very particular moment in time. Um, so anyway, that's my second pairing. Um, moving ahead, this is actually, was it's funny, this is immediately the exhibition that followed Kentridge. And this was a retrospective for an artist called David Diao, D-I-A-O. And he was a painter born in Chengdu in China in 1943. And then um, his family, his family's side lost the war. So they left in 1949 when the communists came. They went to Hong Kong and then, then to New York. And basically, by the time he was old enough to go to college, he, he was completely American, um, you know, in terms of his education and his accent. He has a great New York accent. Um, and then he, he graduated from a college in Ohio that I'm going to forget the name of, not Oberlin. Um, studied with like a disciple of Joseph Albers, who was the ba Bauhaus color theory guy, and came back to New York and made his way in the art world when all anyone cared about was abstract painting and when pretty much everybody was like was white. Um, to be totally honest, right? And 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 not I mean not everybody, but you, you see what I'm saying. So he fought against and and also all anyone really cared about was Clement Greenberg and and you know this progression of into more interesting forms of more you know more and more refined forms of abstraction. So he fought against that. Um, in the in the late 70s, early 80s, he goes back to China, sees his mother for the first time in 30 years. Um, and his whole world is shaken. And then the whole second part of his career, he starts doing what you might call conceptual abstraction. So paintings that also contain all kinds of historical commentary. This room is all about Philip Johnson and, and the, his glass house and modern, or he loves modernism. Um, but there's, there's other you know, strands where he's talking about his Chinese identity, where he's talking about his relationship to, um, to all kinds of avant-garde movements from the 20th century. To me, he's just like one of the most important artists of the 20th century, and he's still very under-acknowledged, and he's in his mid to late 70s. Um, and that's a, this, is a, this is a whole suite of works about Barnett Newman. So he's totally obsessed with Barnett Newman, who is kind of the most intellectual of the abstract expressionists, and who actually in his own day wasn't really taken seriously, but you know he'll do things like that blue painting. You have little silhouettes of every single painting that Barnett Newman ever made. And what he's interested in is like, how was this guy so efficient? How did he become a famous you know, artist with just that? Um, so anyway, um, this, was, this, was, this is an example of an exhibition that's making a case for an artist, that's arguing for his importance. Um, and I think that's another kind of way to do a show. Um, and then we come to another kind of show, which I'll talk about in a second. So the final of these three um, dichotomies I want to talk about is sort of serving the artist versus serving the audience. Um, you know, as curators, we, we also inhabit this very special relationship to artists. I talked about it a little bit a second ago. But sometimes we're almost like therapists or life coaches, counselors. Um, we can be like a voice of encouragement, a sounding board, a sparring partner, a friend, a confidant an advocate, uh, a recommender. You know, we often have to recommend, people often come to us and say like, can you recommend someone for this residency or this book that we're doing, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, once we get into the system, we, we are kind of these intermediaries who are then tasked with doling out other kinds of opportunities or directing attention in the right way. And that's, I mean, that, some people think of that as power. Um, I think there's lots of kind of more powerful kinds of power. I think it's like a nice place to be in and a, and a great way to do a lot of good for a lot of people if you can, you know, take it seriously. Um, you know, some people also talk about curators as like teachers or mentors. I know there have been people in the Saudi context who have been in that role. That's actually one I've never really bought into because I, I think that, you know, the curator-artist relationship is... I selfishly think I'm often learning more from the artists than they're than they, than they're learning from me and from me, and that's kind of one of the joys of the job. But let's call it an open and equal exchange, um, and and certainly not. I think especially when you're dealing in cross-cultural contexts, you know, we work very hard to avoid 
um, you know, the idea that the curator is in some other kind of position relative to, to the artist and, and try to minimize that and work around it um, and to foster an open exchange of ideas. So that's just, a, a those are some of the dynamics between the curator and the artist, which we could talk about for two hours if we wanted to. Um, but I'd like to contrast that with thinking also, which is the other part of your job, uh, with about your audience, right? And about what, what they might need, what they might want. Um, at UCCA, we sometimes, people have often noted that we do more solo shows than group shows until fairly recently. And why is that? Well, it's because until recently, I felt like uh, our audience was, th that the conceit or the structure or the formal device of the solo show was a more effective way to bring art to audiences. That the audience maybe was less interested, even less ready for some extremely sophisticated curatorial argument about why certain things went together than they were for a compelling story of an artist and their worldview. And that the vehicle of the person of the artist was, was a more interesting, uh, relevant, effective container for you know, the substance of, of art. But you know, that's gonna be different in any context, in any city, in any place, in any institution. Um, it's gonna be different even among the so-called Western centers. You, know, you can do a different kind of show in Paris than you can in New York, than you can in London. This is a show in Paris, actually, that I curated at the Louis Vuitton Foundation um, of, of, I think, 12 Chinese artists. And I don't have time to go deeply into it, other than to say that um, it, it's not the kind of show of Chinese artists that, um, that I've done at other times. Um, for example, you know, uh, another major project that is worth dwelling on more, this is a show I, I co-curated at the Guggenheim in 2017 called Art and China After 1989 Theater of the World, um, which was a sprawling and extremely densely researched survey of trends in, in art and China. We, we avoid the word Chinese art. Um, between 1989 and 2008, so bookended by the upheavals around the student movement, um, and the Beijing Olympics, essentially. So a 20-year period where art in China went from a, from a very self-contained thing to a global-facing uh, um, phenomenon. Um, so, yeah, so this kind of connects to, I, I'm sorry, I'm almost out of time, so I'm not really, I, which I apologize for. I had no idea I had this so much material. Um, <laughs> I, thought, I have like three pages. I thought I was gonna be through this in 10 minutes. Um, yeah, uh, you know, or, or f okay. Uh, so, so, so we've talked about these three dichotomies. I want to talk quickly about you know what a curator is not. So, a curator is not an art historian. Um, this show was actually as close to art history as as I think I've ever gone in my curatorial work. Um, but you know, you art history is written in books. Um, not in exhibitions. Exhibitions, when they are really good, and who knows, maybe, maybe there's a very small chance that the one you know we we see here will somehow be part of art history. Um, but you know, we're not the ones writing the art history. We're in a way the ones working with the artists to make it. And I think that's a really fine fine distinction, um, especially in evolving ecologies. Exhibitions become sites of art historical construction. But um, you know, but like I said, again, they are not. Uh, art history itself. Um, it was interesting the other day, I was up here with Richard Long, and there was a question, you know, did he know when he first made his piece, Walking the Line in the, in the Grass in 1967, that it would become part of art history? And the answer is, of course, no, he had no idea, right? He was doing what he was doing, and the narrative went the way the narrative went, and it ends up being such an important piece. Um, another thing that we're not, we're not architects or designers. And we succeed when we recognize that and we invite architects and designers to join us as equals as early in the process as possible. And honestly, that's like one of my favorite parts of, of curating. Um, my, the space I work in in Beijing, as you just have kind of seen, is this big open box. You know, the warehouses and jacks are a series of open spaces. And so, you know, to work with Y, who were our, our exhibition designers this time, uh, to work with the woman I just mentioned, Sabina, to work with any number of, of people is always such a joy because 
you know, they are thinking very specifically about how to create important, uh, compelling spatial conditions. And we can think within those conditions about how to, how to, how to structure an artist, how a curatorial narrative. Um, but these things have to work in parallel. And you can go in this, you can go all the way down into the details of font size on the labels and you know, heights of things and all of that great stuff that we, you know, geek out on together. Um, you know, interestingly, compare in the context of the Guggenheim, one thing that the, the lead curator, Alexandra Monroe, said to me when we first started working on this show is that any show you do at the Guggenheim, you have an uninvited co-curator, and that's Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, the architect of the building, because you can only ever, I mean, look at this, you're not just thinking about what's, not, you know, in a normal exhibition, you say, okay, John Paley, John Paley, the guy who did the, the video of all the um, uh, news broadcasts, painted those gloves and did that piece next to it. So you'd say, you know, oh, he's next to Wu Shan Zhuan, and then he's next to Ding Yi. But at the Guggenheim, you have to say, oh, actually, he's above, you know, Gu Dexin is underneath the Ding Yi, and Wang Xingwei is, you know, on top of that. So anyway, every, every space brings with it its own set of... Um, constraints, but also possibilities. And that's one of the most exciting things. Um, by the way, if you ever cook, if you ever curate a show at the Guggenheim, um, when you're in your first curatorial meeting, one thing you should not say is that you prefer to take the elevator to the top and see the show by walking down. Don't say that. I've made that mistake, so you don't have to. Um, okay. Um, the other thing that we're not, we're not businessmen, um, which is not to say like that we don't think about marketing. Um, a good title is more important than just about anything. Uh, maybe the only thing as important or more important is a good key image slash good poster, right? So we should be thinking about that. But obviously, we're not involved. You know, w it's interesting because our work done well means that the art gets more valuable and that other people make money. Um, and that's, that's great. That just has to be great because honestly, that should come back to us or to our institutions in all kinds of other ways, but not directly in the form of money. Um, you know, we need to, we need to know how to work to and work through budgets. Uh, we need to know how and when to stop and what is too much. But at the end of the day, we have to understand that we're not making our decisions based on, on, a, on a spreadsheet. You know, we're making it based on something much more abstract. And that's kind of, you know, I've been so privileged in my career to have always have bosses and boards who've understood that. You know, especially when you're programming a whole institution. Most of the shows that you put on are going to lose money. And then there will be, you know, the ones that don't. And there needs to be some abstract calculus. You know, of course, the institution needs to pay for itself and move forward, and you need to be able to raise money. I mean, this is, this is the next step beyond curating is fundraising. Um, but... I think the point is that you always have to leave a space for the ma on the spreadsheet. I mean, I don't think there's a formula for it quite yet, but probably, you know, algorithms can do everything now. Um, the, the, for the magic of art, right? For for that kind of transformation that happens that can't really be anticipated, um, or and and can't really be quantified, except that you can quantify it, just not in such a direct or specific way. So. Um, yeah, and, and, and I guess the other piece is just that it's, you know, it's so interesting to, it's so important to understand that as a curator, you're, you are just a member of a much larger team. And that's actually been my most, um, kind of, I think one of my biggest learnings from this project, um, which is because it's organized in this way where you have all these various suppliers, you know, who are kind of everyone's responsible for something else. We're the curatorial supplier, you know, we're the ones providing the exhibition concept and providing the relationships and the interface with the artist. But we're just one among many and we and we work together, you know, sure we're indispensable. There's a lot of people who are indispensable, which is to say no one's indispensable. Um, so, you know, the narrative, of course, on some level it's at the core of everything, but on another level, it's one element and many elements need to, to come together, you know, from AV to cleaning um, to security and on and on and on. Um, this is, uh, the, so in 2018, we opened a, a second location of UCCA by the beach. Um, you enter through a tunnel that you can't really see and all the galleries are underground and then you open out and you're on the sea. This is about 300 kilometers from, from Beijing. 
Um, and I just include this. I didn't put any inside views, but it's like a series of caves. And so on this topic of spaces, um, it's a completely different experience um, when, you're, when you're inside there. And it's obviously not wonderfully climate controlled um, or humidity controlled because it's <laughs> next to an ocean. So it ends up shaping the kind of program we do there, which is to say uh, it's a space for experimentation. And it's become for us a place where we tend to do really wonderful group shows, mostly of emerging Chinese artists, um, of work that is you know, not um, Picasso, speaking of which, that's UCCA after renovation, Picasso, um, which we did um, in 2019. And yeah, just on this, this, um, this closing note of like what we actually, what, what, why we do this and what makes exhibition special. And uh, again, it's three things. So the first is, you know, we do this because we believe in the singular power of artworks to provoke new things inside us, um, to take us to new places. And um, the pandemic has drawn that, driven that home in a way we wouldn't have even expected. Um, in the summer of 2020 at UCCA in Beijing, we did a solo show for an American painter called Elizabeth Payton, whose work you might know. Um, and it was the most incredible thing to see those crates arrive, you know, at a time when flights weren't even certain, when people certainly weren't going anywhere. And suddenly these paintings showed up and you knew they'd come from this other place, you know, from this other reality. Um, and I suddenly felt, I think what like curators of medieval art at the Met must feel every day, which is that art, artworks are speaking to you, you know, from across time and across, uh, across distance. And that is just the most incredible thing, right? To be in the presence of these works that are in a way, you know, independent even of their creators, the artists. Um, the second thing, exhibitions, we do this because exhibitions exist in space and in time. Um, we've talked a lot about exhibitions in space, you know, the different spatial conditions, the, 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 way, the way an exhibition as a narrative flows throughout, um, throughout a series of spaces. Um, but I, I think it's almost, it's also important to remember, and I've hinted at this already, you know, that exhibitions exist also in time. And, and that's, that's to say both a specific instant, which is like the second the viewer encounters the things, the order in which they encounter them, uh, the kinds of things that are in the field of vision at the same time. But also they exist in a historical moment, um, a historical moment in which it is possible or useful to make certain kinds of claims and a moment that will never return, right? So the kind of exhibition we make in 2021 is, you know, we don't actually pursue the timeless. That's, that's the kind of, that's the sort of dirty secret, right? Like if people look back on this show in 20 years, they're going to see an exhibition that was completely of this moment, this moment of geopolitical convergence. They're gonna write an article about how it opened on the same day that MBS was traveling around the Gulf and like creating a new kind of, right? I mean, they're, they're gonna write an article about how it was happening, you know, as, the, as we were recovering from the pandemic and the Omic but the Omicron variant was arriving. Right? We, we are never independent of, of these larger forces. Um, and so that, and then the third and final thing, let me see if there's something else to talk about. That's, that, that's what we opened in Shanghai this year and this is an exhibition that I made about uh, the year 2000 in Shanghai, which is the year that um, art in China kind of went global. I mean, it's a very similar moment to what we're experiencing here now. There was a biennial in Shanghai and there were you know, international artists shown together with Chinese artists. And from that moment on, the scene kind of thought of itself in a totally different way. Um, and so when we opened our space there, it seemed very natural to evoke that. And it was also a way of, I mean, it, for me, it was very connected to the work I was doing on this exhibition. Um, throughout the whole time. And then, yeah, I couldn't choose like one single image of, you know, of the Biennale because, it, it, you know, there are some of the artists here in the audience and they would have been really mad at me if I didn't pick their work. No, I'm joking. Um, but no, it's much bigger than any, any of us, any one person. Um, so I just decided to put an image of, you know, the outside of, of, of the warehouses. Um, but I think, you know, the, the thing that we have to believe in the end is we have to believe the, uh, in exhibitions almost as a form of, of social practice. Um, the way that configurations of artworks 
can create temporalities, uh, can create solidarities. The way that uh, these, these groupings of objects in time and in space can intervene in and maybe even change a society in some way or another. Um, we, believe, we have to believe that they can impact collective memory, um, that they become part of a heritage, they become part of a story of a group of people, um, and, that, and that they can leave a trace. Thanks. So a couple of my questions are kind of basic questions. Um, so I wanted to ask if you curate for the work or the art more or for the, for the people to understand or live the, the experience of the art. Um, my second question is, you spent a portion of your career curating for other cultures, that's Chinese specifically, and now in Saudi. Does that um, change your um, curator experience or the curation experience, or does it affect how you curate, curate in general? And um, um, my last question is, do you judge art as a curator? Do you curate your art that you like or you hate, or do you understand all of the art that you curate for or not? Thank you. Maybe also, I'll just, I'll, I'll quickly hit those. Um, so, uh, sorry, what was the first one again? <laughs> just about... No, no, it's a... Uh... Oh, for the people, that, yeah. So the, I think the first two are very connected. Like, do you, are you, are you, you know, how do you, how do you address your audience, right? Um, and and especially when that audience is from a different culture than you, or or in a different place. And I, I think I'll start with the second, which is, you know, the amazing thing about art is that it can always it exists to be interpreted on many different levels. And so there's this kind of force field that you can work within, where like maybe my understanding of it is not as deep as, or deeper than, or different from yours. Um, but as long as I can come to the determination that it's like worth putting out there for us to look at, it's better if we have different interpretations of it, right? And different, you know, there, of course there's a continuum of so-called understanding, but it's also, you know, I think you also, it, uh, how to put this, like you, you neither want to speak down to nor speak over the head of, of your audience. I think both of those can be, or, or you can you can do things that one, one group of people might see in one way and another group of people might see in another way. Um, I, I, you know, I think, I think going through, and, yeah, I, um, an exhibition is, 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 there are as many experiences of an exhibition as there are viewers. Um, there, no one's going to encounter the same things in precisely the same way, and so I, I think that's the space in which it's possible to work across a cultural divide because, you know, the individual experience itself is already so varied. So, and then about judgment, I mean, you know, I so because people then also and the other question that you always get asked is like, so how did you choose the artists? And it's like, well, okay, I'm not a college admissions committee, right? We're not here to say you know, you get seven points for creativity and six points for, you know, for innovation and, and so on. That, that's, that is not, and there's no rubric. And it's not, it's, of course it's subjective because it's looking at art. But, you know, if, if you, ha and I've thought about this a lot just because you get asked it so much, like what is the criterion? What, what is a good artist? Um, and I think the, the best answer I can come up with is that, you know, a good artist is an artist, um, through whose world you can you can see your own right and and the how well you know what that world is can be anything you know regardless of medium regardless of 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 style or aesthetic um regardless of you know scope of production right it can be it can be extremely humble or it can be overblown i mean all of those don't matter compared to like it's they're they're all in the service of how is a specific vision of things created? And is that one that um, a viewer can have a productive relationship with? And I, I'm even oversimplifying, but like that, um, 
that can happen in so many in as many ways as there are artists and that's and that's ultimately like what makes good art <laughs> do we have time for one more quick question philip i'm, I'm here you've all got night. all the time I mean, in the world yeah, this is, not, this is, this is Thank you for coming over here. Uh, what a great honor to have you. Um, I'm an interior designer that became a curator recently. And I uh, would like to ask you, is it possible to give us a tour of your own curating? How did you do the full Pinali? Not today, not now. <coughs> Maybe we'll ask Raneem Farsi to organize that. Sounds but uh, seriously, uh, it will be a, a very important lesson for, I mean I'm I'm giving a us. tour at 11 tomorrow for the host so if anyone wants to join you're more than welcome you can tag along that's very generous of you Philip I think we need to stop now because we have another session coming up but I just wanted to say on behalf of the Biennale it's been incredible having Philip here in Riyadh he's been so visible and accessible and generous with his time and I'd like to give him a big round of applause on behalf of everyone that's here please Thank you, Philip.